the low make it show. Professor Harvey K. He is Professor Emeritus of this democracy at the University of Wisconsin Green Bay. Did I get that right? Well, it's I didn't bother to tell you democracy and justice and studies because I like because I like the democracy part. Okay, good. So I got that. And of course, he has authored many, many, many books, including Thomas Paine and the Promise of America, which was one of our book club, uh, one of our first book club uh, picks, the first first book club pick. That is true. And of course, the fight for four freedoms uh, you have right behind you. Take hold of our history. Make America radical again. And uh, yeah, I mean, there's so many you can go, go, go onto the Internet and find all of of Professor Harvey K's books, which basically just, take up a shelf just, in my my uh, library. I'll just, I'll just I'll just interject. So I don't know when this coming calendar academic Jewish New Year, whatever it's it's going to come out. But my very first book from back in eighty five, the British Marxist Historians, is coming out in a third edition. Okay, from zero books. From zero books. I was going to say, where can we find that? Fabulous. Good promoing. Okay, um, Professor Harvey K. I have one question for you, and I know you know what I'm feeling and what I'm thinking and what I'm what this is in regards to, but I would like to know how did we get here? How did we get to the country being on fire and covered in rain? And my parents' house, the the roof blew off the other day in a storm that was not, I mean, would was a big storm, but Plenty of big storms are happening right now. Um, I've been caught in multiple wildfires personally in the last two years uh, around me. You know, the earth is on fire. Uh, Afghanistan is just not rolling out so well, but like a good move. Um, Income inequality is out of control. And by the way, this pandemic, we can't get a hold of it because there's just some people who watch a whole lot of right wing media and seem to think that um, taking horse medication is going to get them through this. How did we get here? Anti-science. Well, you know, I'm going to add I'm going to add a little sidebar to what you just said and tell you that I just saw on Twitter. Somebody calling my attention to something I didn't even know really existed. And I don't think they were joking because they actually had a video. You ever heard of a fire NATO? Uh, Yeah, I did. I saw a video of it. It, Oh, yes. Maybe you saw the same. I mean, it's just wow. A fire NATO. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. It's uh, not to be confused with fire NATO. Yes, not to be confused with fire and NATO. Things. This is yes. one word, fire and NATO. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. I just but, saw But it. science is not it. real, Harvey. Um, I have to go to my own sources, and my sources start at Tim Pool and end <laughs> at the doctor who's... It's like, it's like mega preachers. That's what these are. These are mega preachers that are building these audiences, and who knows like what companies they're in bed with to push what medication at what times. And, you know, I don't know if there's some sort of, I feel so bad for horse owners because like they're poor horses. By the way, I thought that when I heard, when I heard about, was it deworming? Is that what we're, I I thought, I thought, I thought the news guy in the morning, which was on a sports show was joking. I thought this was like a joke. Okay. And then all of a sudden I realized, no, this is like serious stuff. And then the number of people requesting prescriptions for this stuff, I guess. I, I mean, I, I'm, believe me, I often ask myself if my father were still alive, my father who grew up in the depression and, and fought in World War II and was part of the generation that really, you know, sort of created the middle class by not only the work in the depression and the, and, and the war, but literally sort of the things they did after the war. What the fuck would he say? If he were still around, you know, um, I, I mean, he'd, he'd say, what the hell is with your generation? I can only imagine. And uh, it's, it's, it's not my generation. It's um, it's it's well, it's not. I, well, I mean, in a sense, I mean, given that certain people who given the fact that I've hit 70 mm-hmm. and all these folks who have been around to haunt us with their neoliberal politics and right. their conservative politics and their corporate agenda. I guess I can't deny that it's somewhat my generation. So, so, so this is, this is a great starting point. Cause I, you know, I, I grew up in the nineties, um, went to college in the two thousands and here I am as an adult in 2010s, you know, 
uh, post Obama world, you know, enter, entering my middle age, right? And what was always so fascinating to me. Don't make yourself out to be older than you are. Okay. <laughs> I guess I know I'm not middle not, age yet. I know you're not at 40, so don't. No, do I'm it. not. You're right. You're right. You're right. I don't know what, I think 50 should be middle age in my mind. But okay. But just, just for the sake of like setting up the premise here, okay. because I want to make this like this, this, this misinformation, this, this intentional spread of misinformation, which is literally moving at a viral rate, right? As a virus is, is moving at a viral rate as climate change is like nothing is being done. This is, this is stemmed out of a partnership, in my opinion. I, 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 don't, I say this intentionally, a partnership with the neoliberals and conservatives, neoliberals to stand down and let, let the conservatives dictate the conversation, spread misinformation, have petty little fights over things that are completely inconsequential to the well-being of most people. And, and I say this as intentional because Fox News, you know, their they're, they're board literally had like Clinton, you know, people on it. And so it is a conscious uh, partnership. And what it has spread, I mean, the fact that Hillary Clinton could say basket of deplorables and not take responsibility partly for creating that and partnering up with the people who've been facilitating the misinformation that is spread, it just can't, like she created, she helped create a monster. And so now you have yeah. this misinformation online. And, and I just want to add one point misinformation Everyone. online. So you've got like the, 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 the far right online partnering up with Tucker Carlson, who is part of that misinformation machine of, 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 there's nothing more establishment than Tucker Carlson, literally as a human and also somebody who's come up through mainstream media and Fox News, which is the largest audience on the planet. I mean, like, this is, this is not some like populist group. This is Tucker Carlson on TV, partnering up with Tucker Carlson online and all of his little right wingers online. We're also partnering up with people putting themselves out as leftists and they're, they're like fighting together on things. And, and, and what they don't understand is the ecosystem is now a space where this misinformation can spread. It's, it's why there are people who say they're left-wingers are challenging the vaccine and pushing on horse medication and not understanding that's coming from the far right. That is coming from capital. That is not coming from the left. That is coming from capital interests. So how did we get here? How do people not understand what happened? Yeah, this, is, this is really important in the way you're framing it, because I'll just note that there's a podcast series that I listen to on occasion, which is decidedly, I'm sure they call themselves liberal, progressive, okay, but they're not progressive. They're, they're kind of left, they're kind of Obama liberals, I guess is the best way to put it. And they regularly are asking this question, but they refuse to step outside, they refuse to step outside of Trump Biden. Right. Okay. So it's like, and, and they use a language which, by the way, which horrifies me. We learned years ago, I thought, not to refer to certain kinds of movements in biological terms. It's reminiscent of the Nazis. So I've heard, I heard smart. These are really smart people who were talking about can you know, you know, certain. The Trump, the, the deplorables as like some kind of cancerous growth kind. I mean, it was just, I was horrified by it. So that, and what we really need to do is, is remember that this isn't a consequence of some biological phenomena or evolutionary phenomena. It's not a consequence of some accident. This is a consequence of a determined class war back going back. It goes back, I mean, it's rooted in the ongoing class war of capital, but it took on an entirely new if you like, energy, um, discourse, use it, whatever terms you want to use, okay, somewhere around 1970. And it was in reaction, it was in reaction not simply to the advances and the struggles and advances of the 60s, which included obviously civil rights, it included the feminist women's movement, it included the public employees organizing, which was very, very strong in the, in the 60s. It, I mean, you, the environmental movement was taking off in a whole new way. It, it was ceasing to be just conservation movement. It was now the environmental movement. I know I'm leaving stuff out, okay? The point is, all of these things were happening, and it clearly represented a threat to the 
political and, and social and economic order. Okay, probably the thing that really led to its funding at the level it was funded at in the seventies is the is the combination of aggressive labor unionism in this in the sixties. Okay, younger generation of folks who had come into an already established unions that had been very successful in securing monies and benefits for workers, but had yet to address the impact of automation in industry and in sense of loss of jobs, but even more so at the same time, the alienation and monotony that was coming to take, take hold in industry. But, and also the, the taxes that were imposed upon business or on the verge of being imposed upon business in order to fund the new social programs and the great society, all of which decidedly made America a more humane place. In spite of the street violence and everything else that, that exploded, America was going to come out of that decade a more humane nation. Okay? So in 1970, even before, there's a famous Powell Memorandum that everyone talks about, which is available online. Just type in Powell, P-O-W-E-L-L, authored by Lewis Powell. And this was a memorandum by a, a very, very prominent lawyer, might well have been the lawyer for the tobacco industry, okay? Though I believe he actually had a decent civil rights record. That's, I have this vague recollection, don't hold me to that. And not long after he authored the Powell Memorandum, which he sent to the Chamber of Commerce, what isn't clear, did the Chamber of Commerce ask him to write it or did he write it and send it to his buddies? The point is that, he delivers this memorandum, and in there, he basically talks about American capital and the political order that accompanies it as under siege from, from all of the folks that I just mentioned. And he basically proposes that the Chamber of Commerce, as a, a vanguard, if you like, of capital, that it start to literally declare war on all of this. I have a quick question in terms of the Chamber of yeah. Commerce, because... Um, was the Chamber of Commerce, which was supposed to represent small businesses, well, was it what it is today? Well, I mean, it's that's what I'm saying. The, it it, it yeah. purports itself as being as this representing small business today. But was it different it back then? Never did. Never no, did. no. It is, it, Chamber of Commerce was was always big business, but it wasn't the only. It wasn't the only sort of corporate association. There was the National Association of Manufacturers, which was for quite some time even more conservative or right-wing in some ways than was the Chamber of Commerce. At least that's been my impression from the 30s forward. There, but then there was also, the, I think it's the National Association of Small Businesses, which is too often shadowed because everyone thinks of the Chamber of Commerce because so many businesses had Chamber of Commerce logos maybe in their window as if that was a sign of a seal of approval. Well, there was but also was like, I remember like in my community, they had like little events and they yeah. would have like the pizza shop there and the you know, local yeah, well, this was like, you know, club. this was probably, I mean, again, I'm not a specialist specifically yeah. on the Chamber of Commerce, but I have no doubt or little doubt. I have a kind of sense that the Chamber of Commerce on the national scale right. made it a point of, if you like, wanted a grassroots dimension to itself. And their grassroots dimension would have been the smaller businesses that they recruited and maybe probably had some kind of token membership fee in contrast to the big corporate types. OK, and, and it really Almost like it, a union for businesses. Yes. Well, you know, one of the things that boy, this is going to take us a little bit astray, but back in the 30s, when capital mobilized, when big capital, I mean, the richest men in America mobilized against Franklin Roosevelt in the American Liberty League, what they discovered is they could spend millions on promoting radio shows, advertisements, Films, that, well, in those days it would have been film strips, not videos. I mean, they could, as much as they could put out books and pamphlets, they could never generate a grassroots part of the movement, the American, against Rosa. They couldn't do it. And you can't help but imagine that they, all, they learned their lesson, capital. And their lesson was be sure to figure out how to cultivate the grassroots. And the best way to do that is to sink roots into communities, okay? So that would have been a, an effective way of doing it. But I just wanted to note that this Powell Memorandum is, is not exactly the first call for this kind of, or warning to business that you have got to respond, for lack of a better way of putting it, in some new class war. Even I believe in 1970, David Rockefeller, okay? David Rockefeller, who was the head of Chase, then called the Chase Manhattan Bank, and is one of, was one of the Rockefeller brothers under the 
you know, there was the father and then there were these brothers. So it was, and some, one was a, a somewhat of a liberal on certain issues turned out to be not so liberal when it came to Attica. And was it Nelson Rockefeller was governor at that point, Rock I guess. Carlos, yeah. Okay. But the point is David Rockefeller was the head of Chase Manhattan Bank. Okay. And he, that was, you know, I, I don't, what he was worth, I couldn't begin to, to imagine, but in a gathering of bankers in New York, in 1970, I believe it was, no, no later than 71, before the Powell Memorandum, I believe, was ever authored, David Rockefeller told the assemblage that we are under siege, basically, okay? And he laid out the same kind of image of the, of the dangers involved as Powell would do so in that memorandum. And I then want to add, within weeks after the Powell delivered his memorandum to the Chamber of Commerce, Richard Nixon, who may or may not have known of the memorandum, quite likely did, but I don't know, he appoint, he nominated Powell to the Supreme Court. Okay, that's a notable... Uh, the, the, so what happened is we entered the 70s, and I can tell you, having been... What was I, 1971, I was maybe 22 years old. I was born in 49. And I'm sure we all imagined that the 70s would see further advances of whether you want to call it liberalism or social democracy. That I'm sure we all entered that decade believing that because keep in mind, even Richard Nixon, as much as he came to be so scorned universally because of water, well, almost universally because of Watergate, Richard Nixon actually spent more on the war on poverty under his administration than did Johnson, I believe. And, and it's, and it's Nixon who signed into being the EPA and the both the Environmental Protection Agency and the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, because he was trying to he knew his own generation was far more progressive than the right wingers who were trying to push him. So, 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 so I, have, I have a question, and that's a really important point that he knew his generation was more progressive, his generation being, meaning his the, 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 uh, the folks who fought World War II, World War II, to, exactly. who fought World War II and then and then elected. Well, especially Kennedy, Johnson, I mean, elected, forget the presidents almost. They elected the most liberal Congress and Senate back in the yeah. in the sixties, and 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 let's not forget that Democrats held the the con held Congress until yes. ninety two. Right. They held it for forty years. They, this is for everybody who says you know, and, and you know that was with the South, and but but on economic interests, this is this is what I find so fascinating about this. Prior to the seventies, early eighties, the culture wars, it seemed as if. Poverty and identity were assumed to be connected. So the reaction, my first question was going to be, but then you kind of answered it. Well, wh why were the banks so upset if this had to do with, you know, riots on the streets and, um, you know, racial justice and gender justice? Why would they be so upset? Because in today's terms, that would be like a great opportunity for them to put like a bench, you know, some sort of flag up and say, look at us, we're so woke. It wasn't like the war was an economic war in the 70s. And yet you see that the banks are freaking out. The war now is more, it's both, it's cultural and it's economic. But the way that they're taking on the left is when the left starts talking about economics, not when the left is talking about gender yeah. and racial justice, which of course is, is tethered to economics in so many different ways. Yeah, well, so, I think the key thing is, it's really important to understand that a key thing in all of this is the fact that you you were definitely because of the situation you were definitely you had seen far greater regulation of co the corporate world than so in the 30s the corporate world came under the democratic supervision of the FDR administration okay and then you know a lot of those things survived the SEC and others but the fact is that they had you know you didn't have that kind of fierce regulation and you had in the keep in mind in the '60s, I didn't even mention this. You had the, the thalidomide case. You had Ralph Nader emerges as a household name against. The what what GM are these cases of, for folks who weren't around? Okay, thalidomide was was the drug that was afforded to women who were hoping to. Be, I guess you would call it a fertility drug. I guess is a good way of putting it to enhance their chance of having a child, and what the, and it was basically. Deformed babies were, were the consequence of that. And it was 
you know, it was nightmarish for the families involved. And um, so, you know, drug companies came under fierce scrutiny all of a sudden. Okay. Um, Automobile companies came under new scrutiny because of everything from the, the lack of safety Okay, the placement of gas tanks, um, the environmental controls that were being instituted. There's a very liberal Congress in the in the 60s. And why, you know, I say, well, why? Well, keep in mind, they'd come through the Depression. They saw that government could do good. Number one. Number two, a couple of million young men had served not only in the war, that was even a vast number, but in the, in the Civilian Conservation Corps in the 30s, and they had literally learned environmentalism. So they, were, they had, if you like, a kind of education outside of universities that was provided by the, the New Deal and the war effort. So when they become, keep in mind, there may, let's see, if they were 15 in 1935, in 1960, that's only what? 25 years later, they're, ni- they're only 40 years old, and they're the ones who will vote. They're the ones who built the suburbs. They're the ones who voted. Yeah, they voted for Eisenhower, okay, but Eisenhower had, was Eisenhower pissed off the right wing because he didn't do what they wanted, okay? So in other words, in the 60s, you had this Congress of many of them were veterans of World War II, and, as, and they knew what the Depression was about, and they wanted to invest in America, and they wanted also to make life better, safer, and more humane. So the supervision that came to prevail, the regulations that came to prevail um, over corporate, the corporate world and the taxes that would, would, would be you know, drawn from the corporate world, this, this was not something that was welcome to the folks with all the, with all the money, especially when, as you enter the 70s, American industry was under, was under intense competition in a way it had not been before. So the automobile companies are not only being regulated more heavily, unions are strong. You've also got Japan and Germany have recovered from the devastation of World War II, and they're now producing the upper end, both lower and upper end cars, Volkswagen and Mercedes out of Germany. And in the Japanese case, the Toyotas and Hondas, those are, you know, those are real threat. And Americans have, have nothing to offer to that lower end, lower priced market. And so, the, and and the corporate boards, the corporate executives, they were pretty hesitant to change. I mean, they were they lived bloated lives, and their cars were bloated machines. And so, you can see the kind of stress and strain that was being, you know, and not to mention all the appliances and everything else that we're going to pour into this country. Well, okay, so so I'm trying to think of what leverage they had. You know, it's it's one thing uh, the way that we see capital today. Um, I mean, the, the, the CEOs are making seven, eight hundred times what they made ten, far fifteen more years. than they made back in the exactly. se- yes, far more. So, so far we more. can't look at them the same way that we look at them now. Of course, it was concentrated wealth. They had a tremendous amount of power. They were used to having power over the country, but it is not like it's not like it's not sewn into like like how biz like you can't even how do you even take on capital at that level. It's so, so, so much different now. So I, I, I ask this because they must have had some extraordinary leverage to be able to accomplish the political magic trick that they accomplished in the 70s and into the 80s, um, which, you know, after that, it was you know, yeah. all bets were off. Um, right. And I mean, the only thing I can think of was that the economy was not great in the 70s. Right. It was not. There was what was called stagflation, the stagnant right. economy and inflation at the same time. In other words, unemployment was rising as a consequence of various factors, okay, at the same time as inflation. Now, normally, what they do is, you know, the central bank, what they'll do is they'll they'll set up an economy in which workers are laid off. Why? In order to bring down inflation, because if people are laid off, they don't have money to buy things, so prices may well, you know, stall or even drop. But the problem was in the 70s, you had this combination of stagnant the, the unemployment and inflation. Okay, so here, but here and here's the thing, which will then set the frame for this class war. Consider the fact that from around 1971 to 74, in those few years to today, the working class as a class of people has not seen a rise in its real wages. 
of any consequence. You know, occasionally it bumps up a bit, but generally speaking, it has been flat. And meanwhile, these corporate executives, especially the financial executives and the lawyers who, who cater to them, you know, their incomes have just just exploded. I mean, it's just, I mean, we, the term billionaire didn't exist back then other than maybe for the Rockefeller ties, but now we've got billionaires and we have people on the verge of being a trillionaire. Now in the seventies, they really did. And I left out a key variable in all this. So far, I talked about these corporate folks and others. Um, we should also add this other group that issues the Trilateral Commission report. And this, this is where David Rockefeller, having given the warning in, around se- in 1970, has literally organized with the help of key academics, yes, key academics from Harvard, a guy named Samuel Huntington, and a group called the Trilateral Commission, which refers not just to American capital and prominent public and political figures, but also West European and Japanese. Samuel Huntington, then, who like every political science uh, class yeah, had to read. Yeah, like yeah, no big deal, I mean, he, never cat. I mean, it was just, it was so, it was like indoctrination. Yeah, and it was, and also um, the guy who actually was his right-hand man in doing this, Huntington is the guy who authored the, 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 the key part of the Trilateral Commission report on the crisis of democracy. The man who actually brings all of this together on behalf of David Rockefeller, but with David Rockefeller's resources, is the big new Brzezinski. He's he's the pivotal guy in all of this. Who was the secretary? Who was professor. He too was a professor. And I'm trying to remember if he was Harvard or Columbia. But he was also, Harvard. he served in Nixon's administration too. Oh, oh, he went on to serve. Well, act, no, no, not Nixon's. Carter's. Oh, Carter's. Right. Oh my God, right. Sorry. Because, because the, the Carter... Two people were in the Trilateral Commission. It was like this vast number of very prominent business people and political figures who were not at that time holding office. So, so Jimmy Carter was no longer governor of Georgia, and um, and Hunt and not Hunt um, Bush Senior. Okay, is given it's a uh, you know the the times in which they are. He, I believe, he's out of office and out of the CIA, and he's no, he's, at that point he's not an ambassador. But how did they pick them? Like who who decided? Well, 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 Brzezinski knew. He knew. I mean, everyone knew you wanted to bring in Republicans and Democrats. Yeah. OK. And by the way, this is in all of this. This is the making of neoliberalism. Yes. Because neoliberalism as an idea is already it's already there. It's always been there in a fashion, but it's going to take on this whole new dynamic. And we also shouldn't forget this dynamic includes developments over in in Britain under a guy named, well, Sir Keith Joseph, who was a very prominent um, politician in, in Britain, and the rising star, Margaret Thatcher. Now, the oddest thing is, is their neoliberalism is emerging in the, in the conservative party, the Tory party. In this country, neoliberalism is not party specific because it was Republicans and Democrats who made up the Trilateral Commission. And it was Jimmy Carter who becomes the president without any warning of his, his neoliberalism, perhaps, gets elected, posturing for a period of time as a liberal, but in 1978 reveals himself to be the neoliberal he truly is when he turns his back on the environmental movement, the consumer movement of you know Ralph Nader, and also the labor movement, and appoints Volcker to head up, you get where I'm going, He's, he becomes- Go ahead. So, you know, so, and what does all of this mean? It means you're going to turn your back on labor, which is the most significant social force to counter the power of capital. Okay. Mm -hmm. You're going to turn your back on environmentalists and consumer folks, all of which says, we're not going to, we're not going to regulate as much. Carter himself said, we have to deregulate and we have to, we have, the word is actually, I think he might've said liberate capital, free up capital to pursue economic growth. And, and one last thing, because I love this, the, the, the f- most telling word of neoliberalism is the word austerity. Mm. Yep. And, and it was not Reagan who used the word austerity. It was Jimmy Carter in 1978 in, a, in one or more speeches. And that was that at the time, I don't think anyone quite realized what, that we were on the verge of a political economic revolution. Because Reagan had been marginalized, it seemed, after 76 and when Gerald Ford got the Republican nomination, but it's coming in by way of the Democrats. So, and so by the way, 
this is also this is also the years in which Joe Biden has entered Congress. So so what. um, How is he able to get away with this? I mean, Carter Carter was by no means uh, a used car salesman. Uh, He was not like. Uh, yes, he won, but it's one thing to win, as we're seeing right now, and it's another thing to be able to move people in your favor, um, especially when you don't have Congress. I mean, when, when the, I'm sorry, the neoliberals don't have Congress, when Democrats have Congress. Yeah. So right. how are you able to suddenly challenge the interests of unions, challenge the interests of the Ralph Nader, who just had, you know, was having tremendous success at that time with, you know, consumer affairs and and environmental protections. I mean, these were popular things at the time. Very popular. Absolutely. Very very, popular. popular. And it can't just be with the, I mean, it takes years and years and years of brainwashing the public and, 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 and a lot of backroom maneuvering a la Johnson style to be able to trick powerful interests into working against their own interests. How did he do it? Okay, so even though I'm technically future me is on vacation or taking time off, I should say, um, it's going to involve a lot of sleep. It's going to involve a lot of napping. And part of my sleep process, other than wearing this lovely thing that I wear uh, that monitors my sleep, uh, is to take CBD. I can't sleep a full night. I can actually monitor my sleep on days when I don't do CBD before I go to bed compared to days when I you know, do do CBD before I go to bed. I can actually see how many times I wake up in the night, how deep my sleep is. And it is undeniable that when I take my Sunset Lake CBD, I sleep a full night's sleep. It is fantastic. I don't toss and turn. I wake up earlier as a result. I wake up fresher. Sometimes I can even wait a couple hours before I have coffee. You know, that's what happens. It's really changed my life. Um, Sunset Lake CBD is a farmer owned company as we know so well, they actually are, they're based in Vermont. They took a Ben and Jerry's farm and they turned it, they diversified it to grow premium hemp. Not only um, are they based in Vermont and when you support them, you're in, you're supporting rural communities uh, that rely on these farms and it's so much part of their economy, but employees are the majority of the company and their minimum wage is $15 an hour. And on top of all that, They invest, they actually support independent media because it is so hard for independent media to compete with the algorithms and the Ben Shapiro's and the, you know, the two-step pipelines to Jordan Peterson that in order to be sustainable, we do rely on these advertisements from really wonderful companies like Sunset Lake CBD. And they recognize that. And it really makes a huge difference in our ability to produce content regularly to have great guests on, to have a team that helps us get those guests and gets us out there on YouTube, on Patreon, on fans, on all of these on iTunes. This all takes a lot of work. Twitch, of course. And we can't do it without Sunset Lake CBD because they support media like like our channel, The Nomi Key Show, The Majority Report, of course, and The David Pakman Show. Uh, You two should try Sunset Lake CBD. I I take the tincture before I go to bed at night. I can also do the gummies, um, the fudge, pretty much anything. When I get migraines, I like to actually roll a, a CBD joint uh, and two puffs. My migraine is usually gone, which is incredible. Um, I know Dorsey loves the coffee. Dorsey, producer Dorsey, uh, definitely enjoys the coffee. And my family, big fan of the creams, the lotions, everything um, that involves you know topical... <laughs> Taking care of your aches and pains, basically. Go check out Sunset Lake CBD at sunsetlakecbd.com. If you type in Nomi, N-O-M-I, you get 20% off of your order. 20% off of your order. They're always coming up with new products. So you definitely want to join their mailing list. They have special deals all the time. Go to sunsetlakecbd.com. Type in Nomi, N-O-M-I, and you will get 20% off of your order. Okay, well, let's do this. Let's start in the present in order just to give people a taste of what I'm getting at. So my understanding is at least 70% of the American people would like to see national health care. Right. How's that? We don't have national health care. Yeah, but the unions don't. I mean, that's the that's No, the no, it's just interesting. I'm, I'm going to get to what okay. I'm going to get to this. So back in the 30s, back, sorry, back in the 40s, 85% of Americans wanted national health care. But between the American Medical Association and 
the National Association of Manufacturers, and the Chamber of Commerce. You put together all of these groups and Southern white supremacists who are in power, they were the you know, senators and congressmen, they would, have, would not have, for their own respective reasons, they would not give their endorsement to Roosevelt's call for national health care in 44 or Truman's in 46, 40, right? Okay, so here's the thing. Let's move into the 70s. Now, what keeps us in some cases from having national health care? It's a very tragic set of circumstances. Some people are already empowered with health care. In New York State, the, the, the shocking thing is that the American Federation of State, County, and Municipal Employees oppose Medicare for all in New York State. That, that's shocking to think that the, it would be a labor union that would deny that kind of thing. And why is it? Because they they have a golden, what was that thing called? A Cadillac Healthcare plan. Well, let's go back to the 70s. You can't keep people down. You can't keep people down easily. You've got mechanisms and devices. So, yes, there was the massive propaganda campaign that was really not targeting working people. That was regulation is costing too much, it's hampering business activity. You're not going to tell working class people to feel sympathy for business. What you've got to do is you've got to talk to them about how they might be threatened by certain developments coming out of the 60s. And this is where the culture wars begin. So I'm not Wait, saying- but they started I'm under saying, our, under Carter, the culture wars? No, we, the culture wars are already in motion. I mean, they are. Richard, that's the difference. Richard Nixon uh, did not course, pursue that class war. He pursued, it's Nixon who really launches the culture war. He calls for law and order. order right, Roger, Roger and, Stone, and those ads that, that they had at the time were horrifying, that, yeah. That was, that was a dog whistle, law and order. Why? Because everyone, if this was 19, if he talked about law and order in 1970, everyone knows that the cities had exploded, 65, 66, 67, 68. Everyone knew what law and order meant. It meant that you were gonna clamp down on African Americans and the ghettos, okay? You were gonna clamp down on students who were occupying and protesting the war, if you, if you get my, in other words, law and order, right? So it's out of this law and order idea that emerges the whole idea of the culture war, but also the, now here's the other thing which helps literally shatter what should have been the progressive coalition. The labor movement is nominally universe, nominally committed as a the AFL-CIO to the rights of women and the rights of people of color. But not all unions energetically pursued that. Some did and some didn't. And what and so in 19, and then you get what's called the McGovern Commission which after 1968, you'd know, you probably know more about yeah. this in a fashion than I do because you've been I had on to, the I, DNC. I had right? to actually study the McGovern Commission in preparation uh, for our lovely uh, Unity Reform Commission, which- Yeah, well, what they did- in the course the tricks. Of, <laughs> yeah, well, it's worth knowing a bit of history is what I can tell you. I, I literally interviewed people who were part, of, I was on the commission with people who were on that commission and simultaneously, I had to interview people. They thought it was crazy. It's how I got on the commission to begin with. I just started, I was obsessed with understanding what had happened. And I happened to know somebody who 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 was on, who was advising yeah. one of the reform, whatever the challengers in the commission and said, just go talk to these people. And I read it. And, and then I started reporting that to like, you know, the inner Bernie world and, you know, that the superdelegates thing that at the time was being argued wasn't. Um, yes, wasn't uh, actually right. true. I mean, it wasn't right. true at all, and they and they were putting right. it out there like right. it. And right. um, well, yeah, you know, and well, Ted Devine knew that too. I mean, he was involved with yeah. all of it. Yeah, sorry. The, the good of the McGovern Commission was that it enhanced representation by people of color and women on the DNC. Yeah. Let's let's make this on the very DNC clear. on the DNC membership and at yeah. the convention and the whole bit. Yeah. Okay, the downside because it and made I believe you'd have to say that it literally also pushed out, but it pushed out to some extent the AFL-CIO forces in the Democratic Party. It reduced their capacity to control the selection of, of the which candidate. Is, which is a, a classic neoliberal move, right? So separating Divide, the fact that, yeah. that unions are, I mean, especially now, but, you know, yeah. are representing working class interests where there are, that is 
a pathway, major pathway for anybody who's marginalized, people of color or otherwise, to have power, especially in a party that's challenging capital interests that are that are pushing them down. And so their and exchange should, was, yeah. here's right. here's some, you know, and that's I mean, that's really the way, we shouldn't now. forget. Yeah. And we shouldn't forget that, you know, again, labor, first of all, is not a monolith. OK, unions vary tremendously, not only between industrial and service and public employees. They also vary in terms of some are progressive and some are just service unions. They make sure their union, their their members are well serviced. Well, the most significant figures really of the progressive side of labor during the post-war years were A. Philip Randolph, who was, you know, go, goes well back into the 20s the black labor leader who headed up the sleeping car porters, and also Walter Ruther, who had begun his political career as a socialist and always was a social democrat, again, in the 30s and the 40s and through the 50s. And he was perhaps the foremost progressive of the old guard of labor. And he di- he dies in a, I think it was a plane crash, and one can always wonder about that. But he had, he had withdrawn the UAW from the AFL-CAO in protest in part at, the, at George Meany's lack of progressivism. But then George Meany also had, I think I've mentioned this to you once before, George Meany had a personal hostility to George McGovern, not only because of McGovern's anti-war stance, okay, but even more so in 66, when the effort came up before Congress to, to literally undo the worst parts of the Taft-Hartley law that had been passed in 47 by the Republicans, which would have empowered labor to organize more effectively if they could have gotten rid of it. When it came up, Johnson was failing to break the filibuster, President Johnson, which he'd broken for everything else. And But McGovern voted not to end the filibuster. And so, and Meany would never forgive McGovern for doing that, even if McGovern had got had the permission of the party to do it and all that. He didn't care. He would not forgive him for for failing to join the ranks to break the filibuster. So when you put all of this together, when 72 comes up, McGovern wins the nomination. But it's also the case that some of the most powerful forces in labor are not solidly behind him. And they used this is what the, my favorite part of the McGovern Commission, which materialized again in um, in our commission in 2017 the reform commission was uh, we don't want another McGovern, the McGovern map. And I remember, right. Right. you know, and, and, and that's, it's comical because if they hadn't actually, if they'd actually gone with the interests of, of the working class, they would have had a McGovern. It was, it was actually kind of a neoliberal choice. And then the neoliberals wanted to pretend like it was some sort of working class, you know, we're trying to have my job, whatever it was, the, the progressives have won. And then it, it, I remember uh, one of the, the people who was on our commission, who was on the McGovern commission, kept saying it over and over. And I finally just snapped at her. And I said, 2016 was your McGovern. Did you see the map? How'd you guys do? You don't want a Bernie Sanders. What, what is your figment? Tell me what part of Bernie Sanders matches McGovern? Yeah, ir- yeah ironically. I, you know what? That's a great analysis to think of Hillary Clinton as the McGovern. Hillary Clinton as the McGovern candidate, which obviously she won that massive numbers of states. Sure. But, but it's also the case that she system. lost the working cl- she lost the working class of Wisconsin and um, and she couldn't and nor could she bring out effectively, by most accounts, the black vote in these states. Exactly. Well, yeah. The, the, but the key thing in all this is that they used to talk about I remember this goes back to the 70s into the 80s again before your your before your time. It used to be class politics versus identity politics. And, and really what it came down to is the fact that progressives did a, have always done a really good job of appealing to women as in middle class women, okay, and the African-American establishment, which has now come to, you know, Clyburn is the figure, right? Clyburn thinks of himself, I'm sure, as a progressive. Don't laugh too much, okay? So the thing is, because he, he, you know, he, he fought for civil rights. Like Here's my did. take. As long as you're taking money from big banks and defending big banks, come back to me later. These are the yeah, same big banks that right. redlined every community in this country that are, you know, have uh, racist policies still in place to 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 give out loans to people of color. And as long as you're aligning yourself with banks, come back later. Well, it's the, it's this if you like this tragic. The 70s can only be referred to as tragic because labor hadn't come far enough yet to make sure 
that working class African Americans and, and Latinos and others and women found a, not just a home in labor, but a welcome home in labor. Some unions did already and some did not. Okay. And the fact, and what ends up happening is that when Carter's president, and the, the pivotal moment to me is this the head of the United Auto Workers was Doug Frazier, who was a progressive, not not maybe as progressive on every issue as we would today wish, but he was part of what was called the Dunlop Commission, which had, it was a commission to, if you like, to have a constant eye on labor management relations in the United States. And it would be advisory to, you know, Congress and the president and all that. It might've been just a presidential commission. But the, the thing about that was, is that Dunlop was so rightly pissed off with Carter for his failure to push Labor's agenda and secure the beginning of the end of that Taft-Hartley Act that he issued a statement. He said, I will not serve on the Dunlop Commission. I will not serve on the commission because they've declared class war on us. OK, and but who he, who he meant was not only capital, but also the president of the United States. OK, that's pretty much it's definitely to me what, what he was saying now. I also, but I also one last thing I I want to don't want to leave the early seventies too far behind. The situation in industry was so tumultuous that there was a presidential commission, I believe, under Nixon called a study on work in America. This is a forgotten commission, okay? And I read this report, and I can tell you this was a report. I think it was headed by Elliot Richardson, who might have been the attorney general until Nixon fired him or whatever it was. But this report, when it was issued was basically saying that there needed to be a greater voice of labor and working and workers in industrial life. It was it was it was something that it was fascinating. And for the and I remember there were books coming out in the 70s that talked about workers control, workers participation. Now that was diffused by these what were they called management you know these circles they they came up with this term the capitalists TQM was a total quality manager. Oh, I have no idea. <laughs> and they created these circles of labor management, la sorry, labor management conversations in the workplace, which were just literally, you know, conversations, company opera. It was all company stuff. Yeah. Conversations. And labor was, you know, it was on, it was literally, they like were literally being destroyed in the seventies as companies moved. They had already been moving from new England to the South to go to the right to work States now they were starting to move to Mexico, yeah. to Southeast Asia. So labor is just truly under siege. And then the, here's the, fu not the funny part, the, the tragedy. The, the, so if the 70s are where the class war is literally taking place, there's this moment, the Reagan victory, because working whoa, whoa, whoa. people- Okay, because yeah, yeah. I want to no, get no, to that no, in a second. No, Before we get to Reagan's victory, um, and then I think we're just going to have to do a, a, a round two of this because we're only entering okay. the 80s, sure. but it's important. Um, I'd be happy anytime. So did Jimmy Carter secure, did he lose union support? Because yes. even while they were- Working class support. So this so this is ultimately it. Because it's to me, this is, I mean, like neoliberals went too far, lost working class support, and it led to Reagan. Hillary Clinton, you liberals went too far, lost working class support. It led to Donald Trump. Um, it, and, and they didn't give up, by the way. They didn't give up. Obviously, neoliberals just kept going and going and going <laughs> like, and, you know, reinvented themselves. It, look, yes, it's but Carter. Does it's Car Clinton. Yeah. Obama. Of course. And whatever Biden, you know, ends up being. Um, the difference is, is that the, the crisis of this moment is is way too big for Biden to even get yeah, away no, with. I, doing we shouldn't at all underestimate the degree to which right now I'm just going to leave it at this and piss people off if they don't want to hear it. It's quite possible that the role of progressives and the left right now I'm, <laughs> is actually to rally to Biden. Because oh, yeah, you're going to piss it, people off. <laughs> because I, no, and I, I'm going to say it this way, OK? The, the folks who want to take down Bernie's agenda, of course, are the centrist corporate Democrats. Oh, yeah. They're okay, not the co-opting anything. Or not, they we get the in Look, I mean, right now it's the likes of Ro Khanna and the others mm -hmm. who are going to they're not 
they're not going to balk. They're going to they're going to hold Pelosi to the promise to guarantee the full three point five plus the you know the already the bipartisan infrastructure plan going through together. And um, it's the fact is that the trick right now is literally. I mean, we can get, this will take us too far afield, yeah. but I just want to say, I don't mean like everyone should be a, come a Biden net. What I'm getting at is that to me right now, the question is to make sure that the Democratic Congress and the progressives stand firm with, with I, this is going to sound ironic, with, with the likes of Schumer, Pelosi, and Biden right now. Okay. I'm not telling you there there are allies on on, on this side. bill. Let's make it sure, let's make let's be extraordinarily bill, clear. Okay. Extraordinarily right? clear. Yeah. Because yeah. the the people but you know with that being said, the way I look at it is, okay Schumer, you want to get this done. Have a little beer talk with Joe Manchin and Kirsten Cinema. And, 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 and exercise your power because it's really yeah, great right. for you to parade yourself as a progressive because you don't want to be challenged in New York. And this is something that's an, that is frankly going to leave a good mark on your legacy. And so you can get away. But, you know, if it's held up, it also doesn't totally hurt your legacy either because you at least look good. At the end yeah. of the day, these are still people I, I, from progressive yeah. states and progressive yeah. constituencies, even though Nancy Pelosi is extremely wealthy, you know, she's at least she has to maintain some assembly. The majority of her caucus, let's just put it this way, wants this bill passed. Absolutely. Because they have to go back to their districts. Actually, I would say I've heard these these these, these Republicans are going back talking about this bill to their constituencies, which they're going to vote against. It's yes. amazing because they're in R right. plus 45 districts and they can get away with yeah. it. That's um, right. Wait, real quick. I just I just have one question before we wrap. Yeah. Uh, did 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 Jimmy Carter. Has, have you ever heard him say anything about regretting these economic decisions? I mean, there's this this mythology not, that not he's to my, not to my knowledge. I, I'm, I'm not. Um, he said he voted for, for Bernie, which is fascinating. That, but I, I feel like that's more tribal it. than anything. He, look, he's a he was a self-righteous prig. With a G. OK, okay what is that? It was just self-righteous. He thought, you know, he, he was a born again Christian yeah. who believed that probably that what he did was the right thing to do. You know, he fired his cabinet when he was pissed off with them. He then moves to he, he brings on Volcker to head up the Federal Reserve Bank. He signed the deregulation of finance, which goes ever bigger in years to come. And the deregulation of transportation. I mean, he set literally set the precedent for what Reagan would do on a larger scale. And since, and keep in mind, it was Carter who turned his back on labor. And when Reagan takes office, he, he just, OSHA, Occupational Safety and Health Administration and other things, they're just viewed as like nuisances, right. basically. And, I, and I'll just point out that the Patco strike was the telling moment where he just fires all the, uh, the you know, traffic control control workers, yeah. Oh, by the way, the air traffic controllers union had endorsed Reagan. Yeah, as that, a result, we'll leave that for another. We'll that that's for another that's a perfect, you know, and you'd think that through that they would that that Democrats would learn their lesson and say, OK, this is something that we need to win elections. But this is why I ultimately believe it's not really about winning elections for the majority. Sometimes you, you, they have to be ceremonial and have, you know, a. a, a win an election because it's just too far. It's gone too far. Right. But yeah, at the end of the day. I'd be very curious if a reporter ever sat down with him and asked him, do you regret doing any of these things? Even in the 80s. I mean, when he was angry and scorned and probably felt betrayed that the Democrats didn't, you know, protect maybe him. They, maybe they don't have the, didn't have the courage to do so. I will tell you this. I will the woman tell you in the this. well was too important. I don't think I'm giving anything away. Ben Mankiewicz, who is yeah. the host of Turner Classic Movies, is a friend of mine. He and I had a long talk about lots of stuff. And he said to me that, you know, his father was the, basically the co-chair, you know, helped run the Bobby Kennedy campaign of 68, mm -hmm. along with a man whom I was good friends with until he passed away recently, Ambassador William Vanden Heuvel. Mm -hmm. Okay. And Katrina's Jimmy Carter father. wanted, Jimmy. Or no, yes, no, Katrina's. Yes. Yes, Katrina's father. Yes, yes, Katrina's father. And Ben, and Frank Mankiewicz was Ben's father. So anyhow, what's interesting is that in 76, 75, um, Jimmy Carter had asked Frank Mankiewicz to help run his campaign, basically to chair it, to manage his campaign. And Frank Mankiewicz said no. 
Mm-hmm. And I'm pretty sure as the story is because he, he, he worried that Jimmy Carter had no progressive agenda. Okay. So, but he fooled a lot of people, Jimmy Carter, very effectively, very effectively. Well, of course, you know, that played out uh, when Teddy Kennedy <laughs> also ran. Well, so. well, yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, it's easy to to look at things on a grand scale and see movements and stuff, but mm-hmm. you, when you get down, to, but we shouldn't forget that history can turn on a personality, on a personality flaw, Teddy Kennedy. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, oh man, on Ruther's death in seventy. I mean, it's just all these things. Uh, and also just staff. I mean, I, I I I know people who've passed away that worked for Carter, helped elect Carter, and helped. Uh, you know, recruit Biden and made mistakes and regretted it and left them and didn't talk to them ever again. And then you start to see how, you know, a perfect example is, is, is Cuomo. Cuomo, like his corruption got so bad that when it got worse and worse and worse, he didn't have his A team there to defend him. And the reason the one of the, I mean, there's many stories that happened, but, but the nursing home one, for instance, that started to go under because his, she, his, his, his like head person, Melissa DeRosa, um, actually said in a meeting on the record that they covered up the deaths. I mean, but, yeah. like, but this is sort of kind of like when you see in, in big picture, you start to see, you read these biographies, you're like, well, actually things started to turn then, not that, not yeah. then. Um, yeah. Oh yeah. Fascinating. Harvey K. Always a pleasure. Thank you for joining us. It was a pleasure we'll to see you. And as I, I on, said before, I look forward to the time where we can meet in person, get, get together in New York over a coffee or a drink. Can't and wait. Uh, you Can't know, all wait. that. Next time we'll, we'll take it from 1979. To yeah, we can backtrack to 60, not 60, 78. Into, 78. Uh, like, okay. Yeah. That's a good. Well, it's, it's worth knowing more about Reagan himself. So we'll, yes. I'll, Oh, to pick up. That's okay. We'll take it from there. This will be like a course. Because if you met Reagan and Carter in 1946, you would have rather have been a friend of Reagan than Carter. Well, Well, Carter Carter was was peanut peanut farming. farming. Well, I'll I'll leave it for the next time. Reagan Reagan was was like a sex symbol. symbol. (laughs) They were both coming out of the military after the war. Neither one, well... Neither one of them, I believe, ever served in combat. Well, Reagan never left Southern California, but in, he did films for the, for the military. I, I don't want to give away more. We'll let people come back. All right. Teaser. Yes. CIA propaganda. <laughs> Rob, <laughs> Ronald Reagan was... The only CIA propaganda I ever want to be a part of is the Culinary Institute of America. <laughs> Where is that? I want to join. It's up in Poughkeepsie. Oh, Maybe oh, I don't. Incredible. Maybe I don't. It's, want. Col- it's literally a four-year <laughs> college. It's incredible. When you get back to New York, Poughkeepsie. <laughs> Poughkeepsie's a lovely place. I've been there. It's on the Hudson. It's setting in the most beautiful, right south of, of Hyde Park, where FDR's. Yes, was. it's a beautiful it's, state. Yeah. Um, okay, I'll shut my mouth so you can. No, what the CIA part? I meant that that's what Reagan was in. Was was in the videos. Uh, With John Wayne, no, I don't know. Wasn't the CIA yet in the forties? These were. Oh yeah, that these was, were, these, it was. These were army. These were army films. Okay. Yeah. I would this do an entire show on this. It's during the war. Okay, got it. Got it. Got it. Yeah, I'm not going to give away anything more than that. Okay. All right. To be continued, Professor Harvey K. Thank you so much. What's that book behind you? Is that the one we're promoting My right now? Is take hold of our history. Make America radical again. Perfect. With zero books. With zero books. Go check it out, Harvey. Thank you. Thank take you. Take care. Thanks, everybody. Mm-hmm.